thank you very much. Okay, it's, I, it's only for me this. So we said yesterday that we are gonna talk about CPT violation, not only because it's one symmetry where this, our description of nature is based, but also because I hope you have seen that a lot of assumptions we have used, we normally use to extract information of our neutrinos are based on the CPT theorem being valid. Okay, so the, it's very difficult, and I'm gonna explain how to test CPT if our framework already assumes CPT is concerned. It's very challenging, and I'm gonna tell you that. But we said yesterday that nobody talks about CPT violation, essentially nobody talks because of the CPT theorem. And even if you decide that for some reason, you are gonna assume that neutrinos and antineutrinos have different masses and possibly different mixing angles, even if you say, okay, just for the sake of it, I'm gonna talk about CPT violation, people will show you with scrubbing your face, what is called the most stringent relative bound on CPT conservation, if you want, or CPT violation, which comes from the current system. This bound was obtained in the 70s in the CPT year experiment. The experiment we talked yesterday about the Gauss, this bound is obtained from there. And if you see this bound, you, supposedly are left with no intention to violate CPT. However, this bound is extremely misleading. For example, this is what I'm trying to explain. If CPT is violated at all, we like dimensionless bounds, okay? Dimensionless bound convey a message. You say how strong, I mean, your the physics behind it is. However, if CPT is violated at all, the scale at which this happened has nothing to do with the current mass, with the average mass of the count, which is, by the way, half a GV. You could have obtained a much stronger bound if equally meaningless, though. If instead of putting the count mass, you would have put the Planck mass, 19 orders of magnitude better bound, okay? But it will be equally meaningless. Besides that, you could have put my mass. 2, 10 to the 9 M Planck's, the same, okay? So my scale, Planck scale, or the average mass are not the appropriate scales, or at least not that we know of CPT violation. So unless you have any idea what is the scale of CPT violation, the physics, what, the correct thing would be to restore units. Besides, you know that the count is not an elementary particle, and its mass is not given by its constituents. It's given by QCD. So whatever this bound is testing has nothing to do, if testing anything, has nothing to do with CPT in elementary particles, okay? So if we restore the units by multiplying both sides by the average mass of the count, this is the way you get the bound written. And this is exactly the right way to do that because you know the count is a boson. And in bosons, the parameter entering the Lagrangian is the mass square, not the mass. So this is exactly the right way of describing the bound in the, in the current system. But if you do that, the bound becomes laughing stock, okay? With neutrinos, you can already improve this bound by several orders of magnitude. It's true that it will be a, a bound on the difference of the math differences, but still. So, uh, but as you know, I mean, the counts are of course not the only game in town we have been doing. CPT test for quite some time. This is a table containing all the bounds collected by Everhard Whitman, I mean, eight, two years ago for the CPT symposium symmetry. So forget about the orange lines. I'm going to talk about them in, in, in five minutes. Just look at, at the blue lines. As you can see, the most stringent bound is indeed yes, the count system. However, if you look at each system where CPT was tested, you see that they are either all of them non-elementary particles or they are elementary particles with charge contamination. So if you really want to test CPT in a system of elementary particles with no charge contamination, this means you have to use neutrinos. There is another way out. But we already have enough data to do the test with neutrinos. The only thing you need to do is to find out which experiments involve neutrinos, which experiments involve antineutrinos, and to do the fit separately. The price for that, you have to throw away 30 years of atmospheric data. Because in atmospheric data, you cannot tell neutrinos from antineutrino on a event-by-event -event basis rather on a statistical basis. 
So if you are willing to throw away all the years we have been collecting atmospheric neutrino data, the exercise is pretty simple because most accelerator experiments, they run separately in neutrino and antineutrino mode. Reactor experiments involve only neutri antineutrinos. Solar experiments involve only neutrinos. If you do that, this is the bounce you get. So you see a couple of things. First of all, there is plenty of room for CPT violation in the mixing angles, okay? Plenty of room, there is some room, okay? But then there is something which is immediately calls your attention. Look at the atmospheric neutrino mass difference. As you expect, the bound, the atmospheric mass difference is, let's say, a few 10 to the minus three electron volt squares. So as you expect, the bound is one order of magnitude below that. Okay, it's 10 to the minus four electron volt squares. However, in the solar neutrino case, we know that the best fit point is around four, 10 to the minus five electron volt square, but the bound is already at this level. What's going on there? What's going on is that there is a tension, we saw it, between Kamland and the solar experiments. They do not agree. It's, I'm not claiming the ICPT violation there at any rate. It's just that I said to you yesterday, the chi-square is especially flat in the vertical direction. So depending on the year and depending what super K gets as best fit point, depending on the data of this year, the, this, the, the tension goes a little bit above or a little bit below two sigma, but we don't have to be very excited about that because the future is going to be very, very bright. Okay, so the Juno experiment is about to come. It's going to be an extremely precise experiment. This Juno is a reactor experiment using antineutrinos, and if we compare this, which which is going to be T to hyper K or Dune, Dune the experiment, the American experiment, twelve hundred meters is also going to measure solar neutrinos to a great extent thanks to the job of Kate Schulberg, who convinced the collaboration to do the analysis for solar neutrinos. And this is, they will be able to separate the neutrino and antineutrino mass, and if there is CPT to discover it at seven sigma. But we have been doing already experiments. I told you there is one experiment, T2K, sending neutrinos from the Tokai accelerator complex to to the super K detector, 275 kilometers, they have already run neutrino and antineutrino mode. Also the MINOS experiment, and they have found confusing signals, so I'm not gonna talk about that. But if you look at the T2K result, they have done for first time a separate neutrino antineutrino analysis, and they have found that there can be a slight difference in the mixing angle between neutrinos and antineutrinos. I don't get excited about why sigma things, but the, the only thing I want to show, this is the MINOS, Result. This is this is Minos and not Nova because Minos did the separate analysis and Nova didn't. Okay, so this is Minos. This is T2K. They, they look that they are not doing the same, but they are doing exactly the same. It's just that the Americans like to put the sine square of two theta, and the Japanese go with the sine square of theta. This is just a matter of how you plot this. And this is way better, okay, by the way, because it's more transparent what you get. But the amazing thing, what I mean, I really ask you to see, to reflect on that is, if you look at here, blue is what you get for the neutrino fit. And black is you what you get for the antineutrino fit. Okay, the antineutrino, because of cross section, you have less events, so the contours are bigger, wider. But yeah, pink is the combined fit. So you see that the combined fit ends up being neither, okay? Not the neutrino fit, not the antineutrino fit. And this happens, and this is what I want to stress. When you assume CPT is conserved, you are assuming a lot, okay? And you haven't never tested that to this extent. So if this hint exists, I'm not, what, I'm not gonna say you, but you will be able to tell if this hint is there or is not, okay? But what happens? Normally in neutrino experiments, and you have one third the signal in antineutrinos than in neutrinos. So in order to get better bounds on the mixing parameters to extract with more less error bars, the max the mass difference or the mixing angles, you assume CPT is conserved, neutrinos, antineutrinos are driven by the same parameters, and you can get then what are called imposter solutions, okay? And this is extremely, extremely dangerous. This is a calculus one exercise you will gonna get it in one second. If you have to minimize this function, one is for the neutrino parameters, one is for the antineutrino parameters, let's assume it's one degree of freedom. So you have one neutrino parameter, one antineutrino parameter, you minimize neutrinos, antineutrinos independently, and you get these two minimum. 
Okay. However, if you assume that neutrinos and neutrinos are driven by the same parameter, just by the same parameter, then of course you will get this two minimum, but you get a new one. Okay. And this one can be deeper than the other two. And this is what we call imposter solutions. So you may end up having a minimum, which is not the neutrino one, not the antineutrino one. It's just dead wrong. Okay. This is an example. Okay. So let's take sub T2K central values, phase value, and let's do the analysis. If you do the combined fit, okay, which is the black line, you end up excluding the true values in the neutrino and the antineutrino sector at three and five sigma confidence level. This is something you cannot be doing. Okay, this is very, very dangerous. Okay, because you are, after all, trying to do the physics, but it's even more dangerous than that. I'm not going to talk what happens, but it can happen with the CP phase as well. But what is misleading here is this is the result you have been shown and you have seen the result that is based this is the result that says that we have ruled out CP conservation delta equals zero at the three sigma confidence level. How we have done that, okay, if you look at this, the red line is NOVA results, the blue line is T2K, and then you have the global analysis. I'm showing only normal ordering because in the inverted ordering, you don't have any sensitivity. And besides, we know that inverted ordering is this paper. So the first thing that, I mean, should catch your eye is that T2K and NOVA do not seem to agree, do not seem to be consistent. There is something going on there. But besides that, you can get away with this signal exactly by assuming, for example, just by assuming that there is a slight difference between the reactor mixing angle in the neutrino and the antineutrino sector. But this is not the important thing, okay? This is the selling point. And what I'm saying is that you are trying to convince the community that you have found CP violation, assuming CPT, but you haven't tested CPT at exactly the same level. How can you know? Do you understand? The point is that you are using CPT to extract your CP signal, but you haven't tested CPT. So why? I mean, and besides, if CPT is violated, it will be way more interesting than CP being violated. So go ahead and do it. You have the experiments. The problem is if you use your data to confirm or to prove CPT, you cannot use the same data to extract the parameters of CP. So you compromise the CP run, but you have to make choices. Life is hard, come on, it's not easy. So, what it means is that we are reaching a precision. We are still doing neutrino experiments the way we have done them for the last 40 years. But things have changed. We have reached a precision such that we have to avoid making mistakes. Imposter solutions do exist, and you better spot them, OK? Not everything is the same, and you have to be very careful. However, I was talking yesterday about non-standard neutrino interactions. This non-standard neutrino interaction induce a difference between the parameters driving the neutrinos, the antineutrino oscillations. They will give you, they will produce that when you extract, you extract a difference, mass difference, and then different mixing angles for neutrinos and antineutrinos. Now I'm talking to you about something way fundamental than that. Through the new CPT violation, a violation that challenges as well the description of nature, in the, at least to some extent, in terms of local relativistic quantum field theories. So, if you ever do the run and find the difference between the parameters governing the neutrino and the antineutrino oscillations, how can you be sure this is just a non standard neutrino interaction, an interaction that I can at least effectively incorporate into the Lagrangian? or really a fundamental a, a discovery that challenges my understanding, my description of nature in terms of local fields. In fact, you can do that. I'm showing how to do that with two generations because this is what we have done so far, but you can do it in general. If you extract the mass difference and the mixing angle in two generations, we have one mass difference, one mixing angle for neutrino and, and antineutrino, you can at least in paper invert your problem and get from the parameters you extract from the, from the experiment, the VR mass difference, the VR mixing angle, and the two non-standard neutrino interactions. And you can see whether this fits because we have bounds on non-standard neutrino interactions from other kinds of physics. If you do the analysis in three generations, 
with all the parameters, non-standard neutrino interactions at the same time, there is no chance you can do that, okay? Because there are no bounds for these non-standard neutrino interactions if you turn on all of them at the same time. But if you do it channel by channel, you can get away with that. Okay, so let's go because I want to finish a lot of things today. So let's talk about the less, I'm not sure whether this is radical or not, violations of Lorentz invariance. Violation of Lorentz invariance can be incorporated into the Hamiltonian formalism exactly in this way, nothing different from what we have done before. This is the standard Lorentz covariant term. This term, the term with an A, is like a vector acquiring a VEF, then it violates. But this term violates both Lorentz invariance and CPT. And by comparing this term with the Lorentz covariant term, you see that this A parameter is dimensionful, okay? And violates CPT and Lorentz invariance. This C term, it violates only Lorentz invariance. It's like a tensor, a kind of web. And by comparing again, you know that this term is dimensionless. These A's and C's are what are called standard model effective coefficients. These are the yellow, the orange lines you have seen in the plot before. As a rule of thumb, you can if you put you can put as many Lorentz indices as you want, but as a, as a rule of thumb, it has an odd number of Lorentz indices violates both CPT and Lorentz invariance. If it has a, an even number of Lorentz indices, it violates only Lorentz invariance. So you immediately realize why I put CPT violation in the masses as a separate thing because it does not violate Lorentz invariance because it has zero Lorentz indices. So it does not enter into this game. Okay, so you start thinking that this is gonna be a mess, but in fact, it's not. Nature is very, very kind. So we always know, at least to understand the spectral distortions we get, it's very, very easy. You can do it with your fingers because you know that the kinematic phase will be driven by the difference in the eigenvalues of the effective Hamiltonian. So if you just compare what you get, this is what we got in the standard Lorentz covariant. The L over E, this is what we have worked out perfectly in the very first day. So by comparing the second term, you have an energy on the denominator on top of the energy on the numerator. So you already know that this term will have no dependence on the energy, it will depend only on the baseline. The second term, the term that violates Lorentz invariance only, it has two powers of energy in the numerator on top of that in the denominator. So you know it's gonna scale as L times C. So you can see that there are huge spectral distortions. For you to get an idea what I'm gonna get, okay? This is, the, I promise this is the last time I show the muon neutrino survival probability, okay? Okay, this is what you get for the standard Lorentz covariant term. We have seen this many, many times. If you add this term, on top of the Lorentz covariant term. And this term, remember, is dimension full. These are the kind of spectral distortions you get. Okay, so it's very easy to spot. If you add this term, this term is dimensionless. On top of the Lorentz covariant term, these are the kind of special distortions you get. I produce this, if memory serves, with an A, which is 10 to the minus 24 GVs. This is dimension full. And C with a 10 to the minus 27, 28. GVs. I don't remember, I have the mathematical notebook with me. So if you put both together, this is what you get. But then you can ask yourself 27, 28, they are bound on this, as you can imagine, tilted 30, 31, 32, depending on the channel. Why to care? Why? I mean, in fact, you will never bound it to infinity. So where do you stop? In fact, my claim, I don't work in violations of Lorentz invariance, but my claim would be that we are just scratching the surface of where we expect this to be interesting. Because from the very from day one, we never thought the violations of Lorentz invariance were order one. Okay, we know the, the universe where we live. So we know we expect this to be due to local effects, and these are suppressed by one over some high scale square. So of course we don't expect them to be above 10 to the minus 20 something. Okay. So we are just entering I mean, the the region where they may show up, not before that. Okay, now we change completely gears and we talk about the neutrino mass. We have been talking a lot about mass difference. It's time to talk about the neutrino mass itself. We learned that there are two mass difference. One is 10 to the minus five electron volt squares. The other one is 10 to the minus three electron volt square. And, but I show, I, I show you this plot many, many times. However, I was always very careful not to put anything on the y-axis. 
because we learned that you can shift your spectrum up and down and nothing will change with regard to oscillations, not even in matter, okay? Oscillations in matter or in medium depend only on the mass differences. However, there is naturally a limit you can shift your spectrum down. The lightest your lightest neutrino can be is massless, okay? You cannot get push it down zero. So this means that I'm guaranteed to have at least one neutrino whose mass is larger than the square root of the atmospheric mass difference, 50 milli electron volt. I can have two of these if the spectrum is inverted, only one if the spectrum is normal. But the key point is not how heavy this neutrino is, is where the electron neutrino content is, okay? If my spectrum is inverted, the heavy states will contain almost all the electron neutrino content. If the electron, if the, the state is, the heavy state is in the normal spectrum, the electron neutrino content will be shut down okay, in the lighter states. So if you plot now the masses of the three neutrinos as a function of the mass square of the lightest neutrino, this is what you get. So you see that if the mass of the lightest is larger than 0.1 electron volt, which we are, we can say already, we are gonna say it's quite unlikely, the neutrinos are degenerate. They all have the same mass. Their mass differences are irrelevant, okay? However, if the neutrinos are not degenerate, they are what is called hierarchical, their mass differences are sizable, then if neutrinos have normal spectrum, the, all the electron neutrino content is in the light states. However, if neutrinos are in the, have inverted spectrum, all the electron neutrino content is in the heavy state. And why this matters? Because this game will end, well, probably won't end, but may end exactly as it happened, as it started, by measuring the spectrum of the electron emitted in beta decay. Okay, this is the Catherine experiment. But I have said to you that we measured this spectrum 100 years ago. So why we are redoing this now? We are redoing this now because we are not interested in the shape of the spectrum. We know the shape of the spectrum. We are interested only in how the spectrum ends, in the tail, in the, in the tail of the spectrum. The problem is that only one, two, in fact, out of 10 to the 14, electrons end up being this, this tail. This is why it's the tail, okay? So this means I need a huge experiment, not tabletop experiments any longer to trace this tail. And why this tail is important? Because if you calculate the decay rate and you are in the degenerate regime, if you are in the degenerate regime, the three masses are the same. So you can take this square root out of the sum, but then what then is left on the sum is equal to one because of unitarity. And you can see that the spectrum, the end point of the spectrum have information on the neutrino mass. And this is in what the Catherine experiment is based, okay? The Catherine experiment, it will say, it will tell the sensitivity to this mass. It's doing this as we speak, and it hopes to reach a sensitivity of 0.2 electron volts. Why we are not so excited about that? Maybe some. Some, someone is, okay? Why I'm not excited about that? Because we already know we are not gonna see anything. We can relax about that. Why? Because the Catherine is not the only game in town. Catherine, this is a, a, a transparency I got from my first school in neutrino physics 15 years ago. This is when the Catherine experiment was designed, or was started to build. At that time, cosmology, you know, neutrinos have mass, and then they contribute to the energy budget of the universe. They have gravitational interactions. And then cosmology can bound a contribution because you don't want neutrinos to overclose the universe. Keen will talk about this a lot, okay? And this already puts you a bound, not in one neutrino, but in the sum of the three neutrinos. By the time Catherine was proposed, okay, cosmology said that the sum of the three neutrinos should be below one electron volt. But, but this was the time of, I mean, the prehistoric era when, you know, people used to say that, you know, cosmologists make an error of factor of two in the exponent, okay? So now cosmology entered a precision era. We don't, I mean, Catherine then was designed, Catherine will move it to point two. In the meantime, Planck essentially ruled out all this space. If you take all the cosmological data, and I'm sure Steen will talk about that, the sum of neutrino masses the sum of the three is already below point element. Okay, so in the next generation of experiments, 
cosmology will be able to rule out the inverted spectrum. So cosmology already said that Catherine won't find anything. Does this mean we should stop Catherine? Of course not. Okay, Catherine should go ahead and do whatever Catherine was supposed to do because it won't be the first time we get surprises in physics. Remember people, nobody wanted to measure the electric dipole moment of the neutron because it was obviously zero till it wasn't. So you go ahead and measure that. You already have, and then we see. However, we, if physics is as we think it is, then we shouldn't be seeing anything. People will tell to you, including myself, that, I mean, cosmology, this, this, there are a lot of strings attached to the cosmology bounds. No doubt about that. There is a lot of strings attached. However, this particular bound is based essentially on nothing. It's based only on three assumptions. You assume that general relativity is valid. You assume that neutrinos have no other interactions than weak interactions. And you assume that the universe reached thermal equilibrium at the temperature of an MeV. Okay, but even if you are willing to relax that, I myself have done that in collaboration with Steve, by the way. Okay, so if you assume that neutrinos have, for example, non-standard neutrino interactions, you cannot relax this bound a lot. There are a lot of cosmological bounds you can relax, not this one. Okay, if you assume CPT violation, you can relax the bound, not this one. Okay, so it's very hard to relax this bound. But even if you want, I mean, it depends how aggressive or not you are. I'm sure Steen will walk you to that. But I have broken down this bound on all its components, and it's up to you where to stop. Okay, I mean, how much you are ready to buy. I would say that, I mean, for me, for example, I wouldn't buy this determination of H naught. You know, there is a tension in H naught. I wouldn't buy that. I'm not sure about supernova, maybe, maybe not slow, I mean, phase two, but I would say that Planck and baryon acoustic oscillation, if you are very conservative, 0.12 is okay. I mean, you, you, I mean, there is no point you are gonna go above 0.12. This bound, the 0.12 bound, is essentially dominated by Planck. I mean, no, it doesn't matter which data set you use, it's dominated by Planck. Okay, you buy it by buying Planck, and the Atacama Cosmology Telescope and the Southwood Telescope, they essentially do not contribute. Everything is driven by Planck. Okay, so let me just finally end my lecture talking about what the fermion mass is. We have been talking about neutrino mass, the absolute mass now, but we even haven't defined what the mass is. And this is, of course, the important issue in physics. So I talked to you briefly in the very beginning of my lecture that the mass is just a left-right interaction. So in the standard model, we put the left-handed doublet, we couple to the, the Higgs doublet, we put it a right-handed singlet, our Higgs doublet acquires a bev, and voila, our fermion has acquired a mass. But forever, however, however, for us, it's way more important, instead of talking about this language, to break down the mass term in, the, in terms of the four components of the Dirac spinor we saw in the very first day. Remember, we say that the Dirac spinor has four components. In the case of the electron, this was my very first slide. Two are the, right, the left and the right-handed component of the electron, and two were the left and the right-handed component of the positrons. So we know that the mass term, what I will call from now on a Dirac mass term, connects a left-handed electron with a right-handed electron, or a left-handed positron with a right-handed positron. It connects me vertically, okay? It makes me connections vertically there. And this is what I would call a Dirac mass term. CBT, however, people remember, transform a left-handed particle into a right-handed antiparticle. So CPT connects me horizontally, or a right-handed particle into a left-handed antiparticle. Okay, so I said, as before, a mass term connects left and right, and this is why I have a left-handed electron with a right-handed electron, or a left-handed positron with a right-handed positron. But if a mass term, all that it is a mass term, is a left-right interactions, why I never connect a left-handed positron with a right-handed electron, or a right-handed electron with a left-handed positron? This is also a left left-right interactions. I will never do that because this violates electric charge. But what would happen if your particle does not have a charge? If your particle does not have a charge, it violates the U1 charge you put before. 
lepton number. But we said before that this lepton number has nothing to, it's not protected. So this, if you want to forbid this term, you have to do it by hand. This is what I said in the very first day, no matter whether you believe neutrinos are Dirac or Majorana, neutrinos imply physics beyond the standard model. Lepton number is an accidental global symmetry of the standard model. And if you give a right-handed neutrino a singlet, there is no way you can avoid this math term to appear for neutrinos. So if you want to avoid it because you want to have Majorana neutrinos, you have to do something. You have to promote the accidental global symmetry into something. And this implies physics beyond the standard model. If you don't want to do it, then you will end up with this term. This term is called a Majorana mass term, okay? And its coupling is not protected by any symmetry. It doesn't matter whether this term, okay? So it's the same logic as before. This coupling exists and is unique to neutrinos, okay? They are the only fermions who have no charge. But this coupling is inexistent in the standard model. And therefore, when, when we say something is inexistent in the standard model, it, it means it's not protected by all the symmetries which protect all the Yukawa couplings in the standard model. So it's supposed to take the highest possible scale of the theory because it will get corrections. Okay, so if you now to know what are the asymptotic states of the Hamiltonian, you have to put all the contributions together. So in the case of neutrinos, we have two mass terms, vertical mass terms, Iraq mass terms, mass terms that are shared to all the fermions, and this possibility of having horizontal mass terms, mass terms related to CPT. And this mass term, let me remind you, this is unavoidable, even if you have, because this mass term, left-handed neutrino, right-handed anti-neutrino, is guaranteed to exist by CPT. CPT says that the left-handed component, the left-handed neutrino, gets CPT transformed into a right-handed anti-neutrino. So you, if your theory contains CPT, it will contain this term. Unless you do something to forbid this term, you gauge lepton number, for example. So this term is unavoidable, will be there no matter what. Okay, this is the importance of this term. And this is why you have to deal with it. Because you either gauge lepton number, fine with me, or but if you gauge lepton number, you have new physics associated to that, you have new scales, new gauge bosons, okay? But if you don't, this is what you end up with. And in order to understand what are the true mass eigenstates, the adistotic state of the Hamiltonian, you have to put all the mass contributions that you are going to analyze your Hamiltonian. The zero zero, the, the first entry is, is zero because it's forbidden by weak isospin. Then you have the two, what I call the Dirac mass contributions, which we assume them to be of the order of the other charge fermions, whatever the scale you want. Okay. And then you have the Majorana master. The Majorana master, if you assume that this Majorana master, this symmetry, which is higher than the others, because justice is unprotected, so it will get corrected to a highest the highest possible scale, then when you do the, the eigenvalues, one eigenvalue gets very high proportional to this mass and the other one gets suppressed by this mass. This is what is called normally the seesaw mechanism. Okay, One mass gets pushed up, the other one gets pushed down. Seesaw is what the kids used to play. Okay, So the consequences of introducing this seesaw mechanism, this new scale are really profound, shouldn't be so, subestimated, okay, underestimated. The idea is you have new physics, but you have new phenomena associated with this scale. We have lepton number violating phenomena, for example, mu e gamma decay, which are associated to this case, or mu to e conversion, for example. These have been searched for, have been bounded. But it's also more than that. This fact that you have this Majorana mass term, it's, if you believe in string theories or in extra dimension theories is very welcome because in all string theories or extra dimensional theories, it's very difficult to keep global U1 charge conserved. So you have it violated is good. And, but by far the most attractive things of this is that you can explain the baryon asymmetry of the universe. You know that the universe we live in has an excess of matter over antimatter. We don't have antimatter in stable form in our universe. The amazing thing is that to reach the universe we started with, you don't have to have a huge asymmetry. The excess of matter over antimatter 
is, is miserably small. This one part in 10 to the 10, okay? So you can, of course, assume that this difference between matter and antimatter is due to initial conditions. But we are way more elegant than that, especially with small numbers. With small numbers, we would like to think that the universe we started with is matter antimatic symmetric, and this asymmetry was, was developed dynamically. Okay? So under which conditions you can start with the universe matter antimatic symmetric and develop this asymmetry dynamically? Sakharov worked up these conditions, I don't know, in the 70s, in the 80s. Okay? The idea is if you want to have this asymmetry generated spontaneously, but dynamically, you have to have C and CP violation, B violation, and departure from thermal equilibrium. Departure from thermal equilibrium, you need that so that any asymmetry you generated is not restored by the system itself. This is why we need to be departure from thermal equilibrium. Baryon number is anomalous in the standard model. So in principle, in the standard model as it is, we have all the ingredients to generate the baryon asymmetry of the universe dynamically. What's the problem? The problem is if the numbers do not work out. The, the electroweak phase transition is not first order enough. It's at most a crossover. Okay, so numbers do not work out. Even if the transition were first order enough, the CP violation is proportional to the Yars lock invariant, which we have seen is very, very small in the quark case. So numbers won't work out even. For quite some time, people entertained the idea that supersymmetry was valid. I think people do keep the idea that supersymmetry is valid, but what people were thinking for quite some time is that the superpartners would be in thermal equilibrium at the electroweak phase transition. If you do that, and if you have, for example, stars or any other light bosons, in thermal equilibrium at the electroweak phase transition, you enhance the order of the phase transition. And your phase transition can be first order enough. Now we are sure that there are no SUSI partners in equilibrium at the electroweak phase transition. And therefore, we rule out the, the, the window for electroweak biogenesis is closed or not wide open, if you ask me. However, Majorana neutrinos offer us a, a unique opportunity. Of course, Majorana neutrinos are leptons. They cannot generate a baryon asymmetry, but they can generate a lepton asymmetry. And we have a way to transform this lepton asymmetry into a baryon asymmetry. The idea is the following. Majorana neutrinos have additional phases. They have CP violating decays, and they generate a lepton asymmetry. B plus L is anomalous in the standard model, with or without massive neutrinos. B minus L is conserved. These B plus L processes are kept in equilibrium due to thermal excitations of configuration with topological charge, which are called spheron above the electroweak phase transition. But at the electroweak phase transition, all the lepton number you have, can, you have generated can be efficiently transformed into a, lep, into a baryon asymmetry. And therefore, you can end up having a baryon asymmetry of the universe, even if you started with a lepton asymmetry of the universe generated by Majorana neutrinos. There are ways to do that. You can calculate. I'm not going to enter into the details, but you can calculate the asymmetry generated. And as the asymmetry we need is not huge, and you pretty much can explain it away almost in any model. This, it depends on the efficiency and things look at this. The nice thing about that is that in some models, in the most simple models, it's not a one-to-one -one map, but you can relate the low energy oscillating parameters to the baryon asymmetry of the universe via the right-handed Majorana neutrinos. The drawback of this model, I'm not sure what is the drawback of this model, okay? But a problem of this model is that it's hard to be a falsifier, okay? How can you prove the baryon asymmetry of the universe is generated by Majorana neutrinos? There are not that many chances, okay? So what I'm saying is there are, are models where these Majorana masses are light and you can get it in sheep or in the collider itself. But in principle, if this Majorana mass is heavy, it won't be accessible to us. So we won't be able to prove that this is the mechanism, but at least we can have some hint that this mechanism may help, okay? So technically, how you implement this ISO mechanism, you have to add scalar content to your model. Depending on the scalar content of your model, the way your Majorana neutrinos do get a mass, okay, especially the symmetry pattern that's broken, how you do that, your neutrinos 
you have the type one, type two, there is a type three CISO mechanism, depending whether you have doublets or triplets. Now, if you go outside, the, even in the neutrino community, you can go here, or we did this, I think in Invisibles 15, which was in Madrid. If you run a poll in the community, saying whether neutrinos are Dirac or Majorana particles, 99.99% of the people will tell you that neutrinos are obviously Majorana particles because this is an elegant and natural way to explain why neutrinos are so much so I mean, much lighter than the rest of the fragments. However, let me say you that naturalness may be overrated. Okay, this thing that you see there. It's called platypus in English, ornithorinco in Spanish, and I'm not this thing in Danish. Still, you are the only Danish here. Is this? It's called the <clears throat> No chance, okay? <laughs> ornithorinco in Spanish, okay? It's platypus in English. This thing is a mammal which lays eggs, which by definition, mammals don't do, okay? So this is not a unique creature. There are a couple of creatures in which cross the borders of nature. They are called mammotremens, by the way. And this means that it doesn't matter which categories you use to define nature. Nature has its own rules and may or may not satisfy your whatever your categories you use. So to find out whether neutrino is or is not a Majorana particle, is or is not a truly neutral particle, you have to do an experiment. Okay, so why I mean that neutrino is or is not a true neutral particle? If I said in the very first day that going from neutrino to antineutrino, you have to flip the sign of all your quantum numbers. If after flipping the sign of all my quantum numbers, I end up where I started, this means that all my quantum numbers are zero, I have a Majorana neutrino. If one of these quantum numbers is different from zero lepton number, I do not end up where I started. My neutrino is not a truly neutral particle. It's a Dirac neutrino. So how we are gonna do that? We are gonna assume first that the interactions of my neutrinos are described to a good extent by the standard model interactions. And then we are gonna see an idea which does not work, but pretty much teaches you why no idea in this sense works and teaches you a lot about weak interactions. So we are going to go to a decay we have discussed a lot in the very first day. Pion decay, and we already know that, 99.99% .99 of the time to a muon and a muon neutrino. But we are not going to let the pion decay at rest. We are going to boost the whole system. We are going to make the pion decay in flight with such a velocity that every particle will be moving forward. The beta, this means the velocity of the pion in the lab frame will be larger than the velocity of the neutrino in the pion rest frame. So every particle will be moving forward. I will have at the end of the day, a right-handed neutrino, okay? So if I keep saying that when a, a right-handed anti-neutrino interacts, it produces a positively charged muon, and if a neutrino is identical to the antineutrino, said that a neutrino of a given elicity, elicity is not any longer a, a good quantum number, elicity and chirality are not the same here, my neutrinos are massive. If a neutrino of a given elicity is equal to the antineutrino of the same elicity, this means that if my right-handed neutrino behaves equally to my right-handed antineutrino, then my right-handed neutrino, when hitting a target, will also produce positively charged muon. So it's very, very easy. Just let the pion decay in flight. It kind of, you just boost the pion, let decay in flight and wait for positively charged muons to emerge. It cannot be more easy, is it? Well, there are some technical difficulties. In fact, you know where the technical difficulties can be because we put only one condition, no? We put only one condition. We say the beta of the pion in the lab frame should be larger than the beta of the neutrino in the in the in the pion rest frame, okay? This is the only condition we put, the reverse direction of motion. The velocity of, of the pion in the lab should be larger than the velocity of the neutrino in the pion rest frame. But this is quite easy. Beta of the pion is momentum of the pion over the energy of the pion, and we ask this to be energy of the neutrino. Remember that this is in the pion rest frame and this is in the lab. 
no matter where my particle is relativistic. Okay, this means that if my particle is relativistic, P is approximately E minus MI squared over 2E. Okay, so this means this becomes 1 minus M pi squared over 2E pi squared. It's larger than 1 minus M neutrino squared divided 2 E neutrino squared. Or in other words, this is a neutrino over the mass of the neutrino should be smaller than E pi on over the mass of the pi. This is the condition, isn't it? But this can be written in terms of the of the mass of the pi on the mass of the neutrino and the mass of the muon. This is a two-body decay. We have calculated it explicitly on the very first day. So this is a very easy calculation. You can do that. Okay, this is the result you get. Okay, now if you plug numbers in, even for masses of the neutrino of order of one electron volt, and we already know at least one, at least one order of magnitude less than that, for these masses, the energy I get is, is just too large. It's of the order of 10 to the 40 EVs. It's, this is not even the problem. Even if I do that, even if I do that, the fraction which get the licity flip is completely suppressed m over e squared is 10 to the minus 16, 10 to the minus 20. So although in principle, this production of what I call rongs and muon is allowed, okay, you know that the elicity flip is killing you. It's suppressed by powers of the mass over the energy. So you know what you have to do in order to prove whether neutrino is Majorana or Dirac particle. You know, to, you have to lower this energy. This is what is killing you. And you cannot mess with the mass of the neutrino. So this means you have to join forces with those people you have been blaming all your life for all your problems. You have to start doing nuclear physics, okay? <laughs> but these people are kind enough. So we are gonna join forces with them and how we are gonna prove whether a neutrino is or is not a Dirac particle, a major on a particle. There is a process which exists, which is called double nuclear, double beta decay, in which two neutrons becomes two protons, emits two electrons and two antineutrinos. This is a very, you have a simultaneous double beta decay. This is a very known process. If you measure the recoil of the nucleus, this is the combined momentum of the two protons, and you measure the combined momentum of the two electrons, you sum them both, Effectively, you have a four body decay. It means the two protons count as one, the two electrons count as one, you still have two neutrinos. This is a four body process. The spectrum is continuous. However, if your neutrino is a Majorana particle, there is a chance that the antineutrino emitted in one decay will be absorbed as a neutrino in the subsequent decay. And as a consequence of that, you have what is called neutrino less double beta decay. You have a double beta decay with no emissions of neutrinos. So if you do the math again, you count. The recoil of the nucleus, the combined momentum of the two protons and the combined momentum of the two electrons, this is effectively a two body decay. The energy is a delta. So in principle, the signal is very easy to tell. And we know the amplitude it has been proportional to the mass because it's an elicity flip. We already know that. So even though it's very easy to calculate, the amplitude of neutrino less double beta decay gets this form. And there is something surprising about this. So far, we have been seeing expressions like this many, many times, except that the absolute values were here. We have been, we have been doing the absolute value of the matrix element squared. This is the first time that we have the, the matrix element square and then the sum and then the absolute value. But these have consequences, it's not for free. This means that the Majorana phases, which were not participating in oscillations before, are participating in the effective mass here. But this comes as a no surprise because we said that those phases will show up only in those processes, my neutrino is forced to show it's a major and a particle. But this is one of those processes. So this is the effective mass. If you 
put it in components, this is what you get, okay? Where the two majorana phases are what I call here gamma and beta. Delta is the standard beta. So this is what is called MB beta or the effective mass for neutrino less double beta decay. And you see a couple of things. The ordering, whether you have normal or inverted ordering, is essential here. It makes a lot of difference. Why? If you have, for example, inverted ordering, in inver remember that the ordering was whether the state with the smallest electron neutrino content was the largest or the heaviest, okay? In inverted ordering, M3 is the lightest. Okay, so this means this is the smallest mass and comes with the strongest suppressions. Remember, this one is the smallest of the three mixing angles. So this term is negligible and you end up with these two. And these two happen to be I mean, separated by the solar mass difference. This means they are essentially identical, but then they have both the cosine of the reactor mixing angle, but one has the cosine of the solar mixing angle, one has the sine of the mixing angle, but the mixing angle is not maximal. We say this roughly speaking pi over three, pi over three is in the first quadrant. In the first quadrant means the cosine is larger than the sine. The first octant, excuse me. In the first quadrant they are all, okay, in the first octant. So this term is larger than this one. This will mean that no matter what you do with this phase, cancellations are not possible, okay? You are bound to have a signal, final point. This is bound to be sizable. Mm -hmm. However, if your spectrum is normal, this is the largest mass, comes with the strongest oppression. At the end of the day, the three contributions end up being of the same order. So you can have cancellations and it may happen, it may well happen, that nature, who has been so generous so far, is playing you tricks for the very first time, and your neutrino may be a Majorana particle, but nature can be so mean that the effective mass would be below your sensitivity, and you will think that you are not, you will see, no, you won't be a, seeing a signal, however, the neutrino will be a Majorana particle, okay? So the dividing line clearly here is 10 milli electron volts. If you see a signal below 10 mini electron volts, neutrino is a Majorana particle. And the, of course, the, you have normal ordering. In any case, the, for me, but this is my take on it, the important thing, as I said yesterday, is not normal or inverted ordering. If you see neutrino is a Majorana particle, this could be, for me, the biggest question of the decade, probably, and neutrino physics for quite some time. Now, let me tell you, I said yesterday that we don't have that many bloody stories in particle physics. Now I can, one, one which is as bloody as it can get, okay? This is the only bloody story I know in this field is around 20 years ago, you were probably wearing diapers, and there was a claim of neutrino beta decay being discovered. It was announced, it was in one collaboration. The collaboration, the, it was the, Heidelberg Moscow experiment claim published a paper saying they have observed neutrino less double beta decay. As I told you yesterday, the collaboration split over the result. However, in the LSMP case, I told you that it was split, I mean, roughly speaking, 50 50. This kind, the collaboration split the spokesperson on one side and all the collaboration on the other. Okay? So, <laughs> I, I, it's, what, what I'm saying is not quite honest. The wife and the spokesperson on one side and the whole collaboration on the other, but the wife does not count, you know? In the, not in the sense, I mean, I have been married 33 years. If all it takes for my husband to be happy is to see a peak, I will say, okay? <laughs> so this is why I'm saying I don't blame in the wife, okay? In any case, this, this was a big announcement. And you can imagine that's an outrageous remark. It's an outrageous remark. Especially if all the collaboration says you haven't seen anything, it will take no time to rule them out. No. 14 years. They had the best, the most sensitive experiment. And it took till Kamlan Sen in year 2017, 2018 to rule out completely what they were expecting. Now we know there is nothing behind this result, but the amazing thing is that it took the community, a community 100% convinced that there was nothing behind this result to prove that there was nothing behind this result. In fact, for preparing this lecture, I check and the spokesperson keeps telling that there was something there. I don't know. 
Anyway, people, let me conclude because my time is, is running. So the first one, the first thing to say is neutrinos are doing great. Neutrinos are aging well. I realized yesterday that tomorrow neutrinos will turn 67, okay? So it's just, it's tomorrow, no? Yes, it's tomorrow. Tomorrow neutrinos will turn 67. And neutrinos make me happy for a reason. First of all, they land me a job, which is something to be sensible. But neutrinos are at 67. I'm not close to 67, okay? First, first thing said. But they are way more sexy and more interesting than they were when they were 20. So <laughs> this is why I'm especially happy about doing neutrinos this day. But tomorrow I will be home, but you will hear you have to celebrate neutrinos at 67 and doing great, okay? And doing really, really great. For I me, mean, it's hard to think, but neutrinos are the third oldest particle in the standard model, second only to the electron and the muon. Okay. Now we, we keep thinking, you have the idea that neutrinos are new particles, but they are not. Okay. Neutrinos were the third elementary particle to be discovered. Okay. Although you have the feeling that they are new, no, they have been for us before the quarks. Okay. It's just they keep, keep delivering interesting results. This is why they keep attracting people. If you look at all the papers, okay, written with neutrinos, okay, you see that I mean, we are just growing as a community. And I wouldn't, you are recording this. This is why, I mean, I honestly was about to do that, but I said, this is recorded, so I'm not gonna do that. But do yourself and type supersymmetry and see the difference in the curve. I, I wouldn't show that because this is being recorded, okay? <laughs> but if it were not, I would show you what happens there. But, but for you to know, the number of papers, including neutrino, matches more or less one to one in number, the number of papers to do supersymmetry, so comparisons are fair. Okay, so we have been doing neutrinos for so much time that we miss the pictures. That we miss the picture is I'm going to show you my conclusions, and this is, I mean, I'm going to show you now my first slide on conclusion, the first slide I prepare for conclusions, and then I back off. Why? Because we enter into technicalities because we do not fully realize that neutrinos imply physics beyond the standard model, final point. Okay. So we have discovered physics beyond the standard model. Now we are going to enter into technicalities. I will be happy to do so. We have neutrinos. We have three active neutrinos. This means we have two mass difference and three mixing angles. We have been measuring these three mixing angles and three mass difference, the two mass difference and the three mixing angles to an amazing extent. Okay. So this is the one, the two, and the three sigma ratio for all the parameters. And although, I mean, I can be doubtful where I claim for CP violation are based on solid ground or not, but they are there and we are being, in, in no time we want to, we'll cover this region anyway. If you like the chi square profiles, these are the chi square profiles. So you see that we have some hints, blue is normal ordering, purple is inverted ordering. We have some hints that there is normal ordering and not inverted ordering, but it's not sure. We also know, I say to you, that the atmospheric mixing angle is not maximal, is close to maximal, probably in the second octant, but we are not sure yet. But there are a lot of things we would like to cover in the next years. First and first of all, we would like to know whether neutrinos are Majorana or Dirac. And we have, remember the anomalies, we have the minimum anomaly based on LSD, which may or may not be true, but we have the gallium anomaly. The gallium anomaly is already five sigma. It is not related to oscillations, as I said yesterday, but it's related to neutrinos, and we better find out why. We would like to know whether M3 is the heaviest or maybe it's the lightest. This means that the state with the smallest electron neutrino content maybe the heaviest one or the lightest one. We would like to know whether CP is violated in the neutrino sector. If no, CP is not violated in the neutrino sector and this phase is, we cannot find it, we still have two phases more, the Majorana phases, if we want to explain the baryon asymmetry of the universe, but at least this will give a hint that there are CP violation there. And remember, neutrinos can explain the baryon asymmetry of the universe. This is extremely important. Of course, we would like to know the mass scale of the neutrinos, and we hope to have some surprises. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriela. So that's, uh, that's of course, very inspiring that there's a future for us in neutrino physics and, and for you. <laughs> uh, other questions? 
Uh, thanks for the really nice talk. Um, you said that the oscillation parameters are different for neutrinos and antineutrinos. And so um, so the contour plots that we get for the best fit values usually, um, we can't tell neutrinos and antineutrinos apart. So are the best fit values um, an average of the neutrinos and antineutrinos? No. Or... no, they are not an average in the sense of, I mean, normally the, the groups which do the fit put together neutrino antineutrino data. But they are not an, they are a weighted average if you want, but they do not distinguish in the yeah. sense that they put all data together. However, because of cross sections, the signals are always two thirds, one third. Two thirds neutrinos, one third antineutrinos. This is why people don't like to do the separate analysis because they, I mean, there was an analysis done by Minos and they found a huge difference between neutrinos and antineutrinos, which eventually went away. But collaborations don't do this analysis. And in the global fits, I mean, the exper the theory groups doing the global fits, they put together all neutrino and neutrino data because normally collaborations, they offer the data together, joint data, neutrinos, antineutrinos. Okay. Um, and I have a second question. So in the summary slide, just, just before this one, uh, could you explain what those chi-squared plots are again? Yep. Yep. This one. This one. Uh, the next one. The next slide. This yep. One. Yeah. yeah. This is, these are the chi-square, the delta chi-square for each parameter. This is, I, I didn't get the question. I, I just want to understand what, what, what this is about. Yeah. I mean, you have to look at table to get the significance, how many chi-squares you are. But basically speaking, this is the minimum chi-square. You see, for it, it goes here, this is the minimum. And you see that you don't get such a, a shallow minimum with normal, with inverted ordering. This means that this is this paper. There is a difference, okay, in the minimum you can get. The likelihood is smaller here than there. Okay. He said if you want the minimum is, is deeper here than there. So this is the delta chi square. Normally, what you do, I mean you fit it and you, there are tables to set you to which confidence level is the delta chi squares you want. For example, let's say if 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 you put a chi square around five, you are 90% confidence level, things like that. This is, I mean, how you operate. You get put the chi square, and from the minimum, you go up. If you go delta chi is five, this is 90% confidence. It, it, it depends on the number of parameters you are fitting. It's way more complicated than that. Yeah, thanks. Ah, this NO is normal ordering, and IO is inverted ordering, OK? Yeah, so I, I guess uh, blue is normal ordering. Blue and, is normal ordering. And magenta, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. it's in yes. Yeah. There's, there's a question online. So she can unmute herself. Yes, uh, Gabriela, can you? Uh... Can you uh... Hi, yes, thanks for this nice talk. I have two questions. So um, one is uh, you, you mentioned that uh, this process would violate a lepton number. Would also violate a B minus L or? For this to happen, you have to introduce uh, like new assumptions, or how how would that work? Or it B, does not violate it. B, B minus L is generally preserved. It's generally, but it depends. I mean, on your model, whether you. But normally, B B B minus L. It's even in in theories in in the theory in the CISO with triplets is even gauged. So B minus L is gauged. Mm -hmm. So I mean. But, okay. So. It, it it depends on the model, but in general, for the usual models, you would assume it's it's preserved. I would assume so. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And another question: As you did this exercise of uh, um, checking whether one could see, for instance, uh, the the Mariana character in um, neutrinos from um, muon decays, uh, and I was wondering, and this is in theory possible, but uh, uh, in practicality impossible because uh, of the suppression you showed. So does that mean that one could do the same exercise with, uh, for instance, uh, um, trying to test um, the uh, this Mariana character of neutrinos using L uh, electron neutrino beams and checking for inverse uh, beta decay, but uh, at the end uh, the problem is that it would be suppressed? I don't know if uh, the question was clear. The question is, you want to do an elect inverse beta decay with an electron? Yeah, with electron neutrinos. So, so uh, for instance, uh, instead of uh, antineutrinos from rectal, imagine you could have, uh, 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 instead of antineutrinos, you have neutrinos, 
but then you expect uh, at some point to have some operability of uh, illicit uh, flip. And then at the end, uh, you do see uh, in inverse beta decay because this uh, initially electron neutrino turned out to be uh, anti neutrino. So, so if I, I see but this. If, it, if this would be in theory pro possible, but uh, not uh, in practice, so to say, because it's you inject as suppressed as you inject neutrinos to a nucleus. So you could have the cosmic neutrino background, uh, like the Ptolemy type experiments where yes. you have a scattering. Yeah. Yes. This and is then, true. so if this, uh, if these are Mariana neutrinos, you would have also the the opposite case. Yeah. Yes, there were ideas using the. The cosmic background of neutrinos with a cross section. The cross section is different if you have neutrinos and antineutrinos. So if you are able to measure the number, you will see a factor of two. Mm -hmm. But ah, okay, so check. So probably this is probably yeah, there are, maybe there people say that they, I mean, I have seen this. I mean, when I was graduate in graduate school, so probably this was not feasible for some reason. But there were people mm -hmm. trying to do something like that. I mean. I would say, I mean, probably because I'm 54, but just to measure the cosmic background would be a big deal. Yes. I don't care whether they are the Akkor measure or not there. Just if we measure them would be a big deal. So Taylor order five is see whether they are the Akkor measure or not there. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, another question. Uh, so when you mentioned the, um... Seesaw mechanism. Uh, maybe we can find the slide. I'm not sure, but you you talked about how you could either introduce a doublet or triplet scalar. Um, you introduce a new scalar. Is this true? Yes. Does it interact yes. with other particles or add contributions to other processes? Okay, it depends on your model, the technicalities of your model. Typically, for example, if you have a triplet pair, you have a triplet, you have double charge particles, and they can be, they have been searched for in the in the, the tech, in the accelerator. If you have in the triplet case, for example, they contribute to the k-long k-short mass difference because of the box diagram, and you have to worry about that because we have measured the k-long k-short mass. Independent. I mean, once you have the complete model, I mean, you be complete, then you can see how it propagates. For example, I know the type CISO because I work there. That I mean, your for example, in this type CISO, you have right-handed gauge boson, W rights. And this W rights will contribute to the K log K short mass difference because you have SU left cross SU right symmetry. So it it, it really depends on how you 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 we complete your theory. In as I said, in a triplet case, it comes from a okay, SU10, which breaks to SU2 right cross, SU2 left cross, whatever you have in the standard model. And then you have an analog of the SU2 left. This means you have a Z right, W right plus, W right minus, just that they are heavier. But then they have these interactions, and these interactions are suppressed by the scale. You can bound this scale. For example, in the long case short mass difference, but also in other models. For example, you can have bounds from, okay, if your scalars exist for the invisible width of the Higgs, for example. And so, I mean, depend how your model is UV completed, this is the, the content you will have. But most of these models have tons of new particles, which you have to search for. Mm. Okay. okay, thank you. Other questions? Online, no questions, yeah? Okay, I would say let's thank uh, Gabriela again, not only for today, but for the fantastic lecture series. Thank you very much.